um, just as uh, telegenetics and newer technologies have expanded patient and family connections, for most families, having a local primary care provider remains important to care coordination, access to community services, and many less genetic focused services. Given the size of the genetics workforce and need for collaboration, NIMAC supports primary provider and genetic provider collaboration. We appreciate the attendees who cover those bases. Our next speaker will focus on strengthening ties between primary care providers and genetic professionals. Dr. Raylan Forsyth is a medical genetics fellow at Johns Hopkins, where she completed her residency in pediatrics and genetics. She's particularly interested in integrating genetics education and the clinical training of non-geneticists. She will begin a one-year medical biochemical genetics fellowship at Pittsburgh in July. I'm confident she will continue to contribute to NIMAC in many ways. Raylan, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, such a pleasure to be giving a talk today at my first NIMAC conference. Thank you to Joanne for giving me this opportunity and the rest of the NIMAC team. Uh, what a talk to follow though. Um, just really inspiring and makes me really excited again each and every day to be a geneticist. Um, and so my hope is that my talk will build upon the content we just heard and the content from yesterday um, and that I'll be going over some virtual tools um, that hopefully will improve and make more equitable the access to genetics care and knowledge for primary care providers and families, even beyond just getting a genetic diagnosis. I have no disclosures. I will be referencing some specific services offered by various companies and institutions as examples, but have no personal or financial interest in any of them. And before we start talking about how some of the virtual tools can change the way PCPs and families interact with genetics, I just wanted to ground us in what I'm calling kind of this historical traditional model of the interaction, whereby a PCP recognizes a patient has features that are suggestive of a genetic syndrome, either they recognize them themselves or they were brought to the attention by a concerned family member, they place a referral to genetics, the patient comes to see a geneticist in person historically, though obviously with telehealth ex expansion over the last year, that's going to change permanently. Um, but they come, they get the evaluation that we heard about from Dr. Kim yesterday. Um, there might be some genetic testing that um, is part of that evaluation. Um, and those results are then communicated weeks to months later when they, they come back. Um, and there's some plan for follow-up, usually involving seeing a geneticist maybe every one to two years um, or periodically, but not nearly as much as they're following with their primary care provider or other specialist. Um, so just um, to kind of open our discussion, I know we talked about this a little bit yesterday, um, but what are some of the barriers to this traditional model of service? Um, so if you could put in the chat some short phrases of uh, what you think are barriers um, to this kind of approach, I'm gonna monitor that. Um, and I'm particularly interested in hearing from patients and families um, and the non-geneticists because you're really the primary stakeholders in this interaction. Um, geneticists can think we're finding all kinds of solutions to this, but if we're not really ad addressing the primary issues that you have, then we're not really doing a great job. So I'm seeing a lot about wait time to see genetics professionals, uh, long distances, patients have financial concerns, there's workforce issues access yeah so that's really the theme right of why we're all here that access to care um is is limited um, and so not surprising one of the biggest barriers in terms of access to care is just purely number driven there aren't enough geneticists to meet increasing demand so this is a figure from the u.s government accountability office um, from a July 2020 report that they created after analyzing data from the American Board of Medical Genetics. And it shows the number of geneticists per half a million people across the country, whereby um, the lighter blue is about zero to three providers um, and the darker, fewer states that are darker, it's three to five. Um, so that's not very many. And you can see this map looks a lot like any other health disparities map. Um, and additionally, even though there are some states such as the state where I'm from, Maryland, that looks like it's doing a pretty good job, um, I can tell you that a lot of those providers, if not all, are concentrated in the Baltimore area, meaning they're still hours away from some Marylanders. So these numbers have resulted in longer wait times. Here's some data to, to show that. Um, and often up to several months 
these patients are waiting to see a, see a provider. Um, I also think that these numbers have exacerbated the deficiencies in genetics knowledge amongst our non-geneticist colleagues, since we're really not a readily visible specialty in communities, um, don't have those same interactions with primary providers that maybe other subspecialists do. Uh, but thankfully, we're all here today and yesterday, and we'll continue to work together um, to think about our outreach, even if it is at a distance. And perhaps some of the tools that I'll talk about are some of the keys. So I just did want to briefly review some of the resources that I know many of us know and use every day. But just as a reminder to be sharing these well curated resources with our non geneticist colleagues and families. Um, so they don't feel like they have to turn to uh, Dr. Google. I think Lynn mentioned that yesterday in her talk. Um, so, and as a Hawkins trainee, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention OMIM as a place where really anybody can go to input features and think about a genetic differential diagnosis. Um, but really, and you know, that the talk just now is inspiring that this AI technology, um, such as the ones that um, were shown previously, but in face to gene as well, um, that they continue to evolve and be incorporated, such as, um, such as in places like the electronic medical record, to really help identify patients who should be referred to genetics. Uh, once a diagnosis is obtained, gene reviews can be uh, used by providers to better understand the condition and follow management guidelines. Uh, while the genetics home reference now on Medline is really a, in a language written for everybody, and I find it useful and reminding me about language to use to talk with families or other healthcare providers. Um, and so I really just encourage um, the, the genetics providers listening and to be diligent, and, uh, diligent about sharing these reputable resources. They are on NIMAC's website um, as well as several others. Um, but now I'd really like to use a few fictional cases, um, few, fictional but realistic, to illustrate how a few newer virtual tools can be used to really bridge the gap between PCPs and geneticists. Um, so some of these tools I learned about just for the first time preparing this talk. So if anyone has experience with any of them, put them in the chat. Um, would love to hear about your real life experiences and hopefully we can have some interaction going on through this talk. Um, so in this first case, we have a busy PCP. You know, what PCP isn't busy? Um, they know the importance of family history. They've even documented it here in the electronic med medical record, which is a huge first step to be able to look at and refer to and think about. Um, but then they're lacking the capacity to do the next steps, um, even though they have identified a pretty strong family history here. It's a little bit blurry of uh, cancers in the family, specifically pancreatic and ovarian two rare cancers. Um, so what do they do next? Well, this could be a case where the patient doesn't really even necessarily need to see a genetic provider right away. They just might need some genetic testing um, if it's indicated. And so this can be accomplished through virtual assistance. This one is called GIA. It's offered through the Invite laboratory. And how it works is that it's an inter one of those interactive chat bots that we just heard about, um, where there's a link that gets sent to a patient prior to an appointment via text. Um, and there's communication with this chat bot about personal history, family history, and then there's some pre-test counseling that's provided. And a recommendation based off of the information collected um, is used to either recommend or not recommend genetic testing and then send any recommended testing uh, orders to the provider to sign. Um, and then the provider can actually set it up so that the GIA, the chatbot, re reviews the results with the patient, sets up uh, an appointment with a genetic counselor if necessary, say if the results are positive and there needs to be more discussion. Um, and this can actually be set up to screen all patients in a clinic for hereditary cancer syndromes, which as we know is one of the more common genetic diagnoses that could come out of us. Um, taking a family history. And so another example of a virtual assistant can be integrated, that can be integrated in primary care clinics is the AMBRI's care program. Um, it's very similar um, in the, and it's set up to the one that I just described. And then similarly, applications have been developed to help facilitate the disclosure of genetic testing. So say you, you know, have a patient, you on the genetic testing, but now a lot of time is spent on discussing results. And so I know this is a little bit blurry, but it shows um, 
what's called the GUIA application that was developed as part of the New York City Kids Speak project um, that recruited and sequenced thousands of individuals um, from minority groups in New York City. Um, and this is a digital platform that's available in Spanish and English, uh, which breaks down the results um, and next steps. So um, it has results, next steps, explains secondary findings, and then has some resources just about genetic testing, DNA, what, what is genetic. Um, so we heard yesterday that families really don't feel like they have the capacity to really process a lot of information after hearing a diagnosis for the first time that can result from testing. So I think this digital platform um, or other um, applications like it um, could be really beneficial to be used when the family is ready to go, uh, go in and get some of that more information. And additionally, something like this could be shared with a PCP to facilitate next steps and provide education. Uh, but many of these applications assistants still rely on the back end uh, uh, with, for uh, genetic counselor input um, and some after the fact that there are results that come back that a patient needs to see a genetic counselor about. So I just wanted to show you the genetic counselor map um, by the numbers. I know we have a large genetic counselor cohort here. I'm curious to hear uh, what you think about these numbers. To me, it looks a little bit more promising than the geneticist map. Um, there's more states that are darker blue, which in this case is about seven to 10 genetic counselors per half a million people. And the workforce projections um, do have good growth over the ne next seven years um, and is a little bit more dispersed among public and private sectors. So I really consider genetic counselors as a major resource and, a, if you will, a tool um, to facilitate interactions with PCPs, um, in addition to working with subspecialists to see patients with known or suspected genetic conditions. Um, they now have larger roles um, in offering telehealth via commercial companies and laboratories, um, and they can even be utilized within PCP offices um, or embedded in primary care practices. Um, and so. Uh, hopefully, we can provide them with more autonomy in our work here together. Uh, but moving on to our next case, so sometimes a PCP knows about the diagnosis, knows of management guidelines, for example, if they're taking care of a patient with Down syndrome, but distance to get that child to the clinic that might better serve their needs and have the experts that um, can really work with them best um, could be a barrier. Um, to getting this care. And so telehealth has overcome some of that distance barrier, um, but as we talked about time and wait times, insurance issues can still be um, barriers that even prohibit telehealth. So with this in mind, uh, Dr. Brian Scotco, co-director of the Down Syndrome Clinic at Mass General created this really unique model of service called Down Syndrome Clinic to You. Uh, whereby caregivers enter medical information into um, uh, an online database um, that then a computational algorithm analyzes to generate provider and caregiver reports with recommendations. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of a tour of their website, and then we'll have you explore this model of service a little bit further in small groups. So I'm going to stop sharing my PowerPoint and share my internet. So uh, one thing to note about the Down Syndrome Clinic to you is that it is available in Spanish as well. Uh, I'm gonna flip it back to English for this demo, uh, but it does have some testimonials at the bottom um, so that talk through some of the things that I just mentioned. So uh, for example, this family had barriers with insurance. Um, this caregiver found that she was always educating her um, child's providers um, and felt like this tool helped her do that better. And then I just really like this one. I think it fits with the theme of today that one of the challenges of practicing in a small town is finding resources. Um, frequently was weighing whether or not it was worth sending patients on a 10 hour trip um, so this might not replace an actual specialty clinic, but could certainly stand to improve care. And so then I just wanted to show you some of the sample reports. So I'm actually going to pull up the caregiver one because it's a little bit more detailed. And 
And uh, so that's just kind of an introduction of what they do and who they are and what this is for. Um, and it's um, several pages that goes over recommendations based off of, like I said, the information that was entered. Um, and this is based off of the um, AAP healthcare guidelines. So it talks through that um, it's recommended that this child have a hearing test and an eye exam. If you click on some of these links, it will take you to some resources that are Down syndrome specific, but um, some of the other resources that they provide are really generalizable. Um, so, and then it goes beyond just the guidelines too. It talks about conditions, you know, outside of, uh, just what we think about historically for Down syndrome, some health and wellness resources, food assistance, um, nutrition recommendations. So like, here's a link to 20 ways to encourage fruit and vegetable intake. Like I could probably print that off and use it for every single patient that I see. Um, and then just some other life skills suggestions and so on and so forth. Um, and so now I think Fred and his team will place you into breakout rooms. And I just wanted you to explore this website further, specifically look at some of the FAQs at the bottom of the homepage. Um, and there'll be a link in the chat uh, to get to this website. And uh, maybe whoever is closest to the Boston area, since that's where this is from, can share their screen to help facilitate the conversation. Um, and then we'll come back ready to discuss some of the considerations of this model. Uh, but welcome back. I know that really wasn't very much time, but hopefully you got to explore and peruse this new kind of model. Um, so just wondering if anyone wants to share in the chat what your thoughts are um, on benefits or even just some considerations um, that should be kept in mind when we're thinking about using a model like this in genetics. Efficient. Yeah, um, if you read some of the specifics of the FAQs, uh, it says that you get a report pretty much immediately. How to get local providers to learn about and use this. Yes, that's, the, that's one of the continued challenges that hopefully we all can brainstorm how to get this into the hands of those who need it most. Saves to family so much time. Our breakout room discussed whether patients would be concerned about privacy, um, but we had a parent perspective who said she would appreciate the resource. And so I do, they have some kind of vague language on their um, FAQs about privacy. So, if, you know, anything with the internet, um, I know I understand that concern. Excellent resource for providers and patients. Any other similar programs? So not that I'm aware of if there are similar programs for other disorders besides Down syndrome, um, but they there most likely are. Um, I, I think Alyssa mentioned things like cystic fibrosis, sickle cell, some of those other disorders um, likely could have a model like this. Yeah. Yeah, uh, one of the concerns is that it will frustrate a family who is in need of a human. So in that case, uh, perhaps it's the primary care provider then that's driving the input to get you know, their own report for themselves. Um, they can maybe help the family navigate the application, but then really take on even more ownership of that, that patient to be that human connection. And um, And Alyssa just mentioned it must have taken them a lot of time to build this resource, curious to find uh, out how to fund other similar ones and uh, how often do you update it. So definitely not a perfect solution by any means, um, but just something that um, I think we'll probably see more of, especially as the virtual world um, thrives. So I'll go ahead and Share my screen again when I'm allowed. <laughs> it's just saying that I cannot oh, share my screen while the other participant is sharing. Go ahead now. Yeah, I was still sharing sound, my fault.
And so some other considerations that I just had kind of initially after looking at this model too, I didn't really call them pros or cons because I think it depends on your perspective, um, but it is completely online, uh, which uh, may, may make it more accessible to uh, a lot of people, but still could be a barrier for others that don't have that broadband access. It is available in English and Spanish, so not other languages that um, could be needed. And there is a cost to use it. So it's actually $49 per use. Um, and that is covered sometimes by insurances and there are some discount codes available. So, um, you know, depending on your financial situation that might also be a barrier or something that you find as beneficial if there's some um, larger financial or insurance issues. Uh, another important point is that this model does require and rely on guidelines that can be used to create the computational algorithm. Um, but there are actually guidelines out there for some of the most common genetic conditions. I've listed those ones here with their PubMed ID. Um, so it's theoretical that it, you could develop um, a similar algorithm for other conditions beyond um, just Down syndrome. And like I pointed out, some of those uh, resources weren't specific to Down syndrome, they were more generalizable. Um, so kind of moving on to our last fictional case, um, sometimes we find that it's patients and families that could be the ones that facilitate the PCP geneticist interaction. Um, so in this case, we have a PCP who's taking care of an individual with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and is pointed to that society website by the patient. Um, and here they come across something called Project Echo. So um, please put in the chat if you've used the Project Echo or have um, participated in one. Um, so, but for those who are unfamiliar, Project Echo, which stands for Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes, was developed in 2003 um, at the University of New Mexico to provide free education to community providers through live interactive telementoring sessions. Um, and it wasn't started for genetics, it was actually started for um, an, an expert on hepatitis C, or C, sorry, who wanted to have broader outreach to the community to take care of patients with that um, disease. Um, but the goal of this technology that then <clears throat> has really thrived is to leverage scarce resources. So in this case, um, experts on various conditions to disseminate knowledge and reduce disparities. Um, and again, here, primary care providers are retaining that human interaction and autonomy and patient management, but are empowered then with the information gained through these sessions. Um, so there's been a huge uptake of Project F um, Echoes worldwide um, since it started, um, but especially you can see here in 2020, 149 new hubs were launched um, and over 250,000 new learners. Uh, participated last year. I think just again echoing, if I can, uh, the virtual world that we're now living in. Um, but like I said, project echoes are not limited to genetic conditions. In fact, um, genetic focused echoes make up only a very small fraction of the current project. Um, so I was just going to show you a little bit about their website real quick. Um, just so you've seen it once here. It's a little bit um, difficult to navigate. So I just wanted to point you to where I've looked for things. So here is their main uh, web page. Um, again, you can translate the information here into Spanish. Um, now, not all Project Echoes will be available in Spanish, but um, at least to kind of learn about uh, what Project Echo is, you can read about it in Spanish. Um, but I went to hubs and programs. And you can actually look at lists um, and list of all the hubs and super hubs. And as, yeah, usually it, it uh, has a 17 page PDF that goes over all of the institutions that are offering echoes and then what their focus area is. Um, so genetics isn't really the search term here. I actually found some of these by searching rare. Um, so you just kind of have to play around with it to find what you're looking for. And then really going to that institution site uh, to learn about their echoes in more detail. Um, 
So for example, here, there's one from Johns Hopkins and Hematology and Rare Diseases. I know that this is um, a sickle cell project echo. And so let me share that. And it looks like some of our uh, participants have, um, or have participated in echo calls. So maybe um, I'll call on Kelly, do you want to share what your experience was in participating in ECHO projects most recently as the one in long-term COVID? I'd love to hear it. Helps if I unmute. Um, I <laughs> actually have participated in several across the years. My son is on the autism spectrum and you know the design of those is such that you get a lot of practitioners there. Generally, somebody presents some information and then um, half of the time is generally spent on sharing information and updates. So they're really tracking new information about long COVID and, and um, you know, various aspects of uh, you know, clinical care and approaches and barriers um, that they're experiencing and that have been identified. But th those are basically the format, and it, it really is incredible for rural practitioners who don't have access to others, which is what I understand how it started, um, to, to get connections with others who can provide more insights into um, you know, long-term care. One of our um, early hearing and detection committees is meeting with uh, you know, audiologists and, and practitioners who deal with hearing issues using an echo format and it enables them to connect and then again to learn from one another. Thank you for sharing that experience. Um, and it looks like some other people put in the chat too that um, so uh, NIMAC doesn't have uh, their own project echoes, but the colleagues in the Southeast region um, actually have an echo tomorrow about um, COVID-19 vaccine for adult genetics patients. Um, it's like Dana Yarbo also said that they're doing a three-state learn the signs act early echo that has been great. Um, so <clears throat> like I said, there aren't, um, compared to some of the other subspecialties that are represented in Project Echo, genetics might have a small fraction, but I think this can be a resource that's leveraged, especially now that we're in this virtual world. Uh, to reach out to community providers and get them the knowledge that they need. Um, so other considerations of Project ECHO is that it is free. There's no associated cost to participate. The sessions are often recorded um, so that once you've signed up, you can go back and listen. Um, there really isn't direct involvement of patients and families so they can obviously sign up themselves. Um, and here are some of the current echoes that I found uh, quickly for specific genetic conditions. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to touch upon uh, how we use clinical documentation to interact with um, other care providers. Um, so providers on the call are probably aware that the 21st Century Care Cures Act is now in full effect, um, which means that um, full clinical documentation and test results except in very limited circumstances where a patient requests results not to be shared or withholding will prevent harm. Um, those are all now immediately available to patients and their proxies. Um, so I think this will continue to make providers thoughtful about how we write about um, patients and uh, you know, our thoughts in the EMR. Um, but I feel like this can also be a really powerful tool to facilitate communication um, between subspecialists and PCPs and families. Um, and then share resources that then live permanently in somebody's medical record. Um, so I had just a quick poll. Um, if you're a provider, do you think that the 21st Century Cures Act will affect how and what you document? And if you're a patient or family, do you think that this access could be useful? And Raylan, we've got that poll up right now and folks mm -hmm. are flooding in. So I'll just go ahead and keep it posted um, as those responses come in. And it looks like about 50 people have voted so far out of 160. Those numbers are still raise, rising up here. Mm -hmm. 
and we're starting to slow down. I'm going to go ahead and end the poll in three, two, one. And I'm going to go ahead and share the results here for you. Okay, so that's a little bit of a mix. Um, I'm curious to hear from the people who said yes, either providers or patients, families, uh, what made you say yes? What um, will you change or what would you find useful? If you want to just put it in the chat. And I, I appreciate the percentages that said not sure. I think, you know, moving into this still uncertain future of what this will look like. Yeah, so somebody said the downside is that um, it's a gold mine for this small number of people who uh, might play the malpractice gotcha game. Uh, potentially saves a communication step. Okay, well, if people want to keep kind of thinking about that um, and putting that in the chat, I, you know, it's here, it's not going anywhere. So I think um, if we can start leveraging it to, you know, to be a resource that can provide outreach and education and facilitate communication, um, you know, we can harbor it that oh, way. No, um, so Uh, Raylin, you're muted. Yeah. Can you hear? Yeah, I think I'm good now. Great. <laughs> um, so to close, I just wanted to provide some final recommendations and some calls to action moving forward for all of the stakeholders here in this collaborative process. Um, first, for us as genetic providers, I think we need to continue to train and recruit uh, new people to our field um, to bolster some of those numbers I showed you at the beginning. Um, to create more standardized guidelines that can be used for those computational algorithms and dispersed widely, uh, to make existing educational content that we already have, you know, who, who doesn't have slide decks of things that could be shared um, and used as resources, um, but to really figure out um, systematic ways to share that more widely, um, and then utilize the required documentation to our advantage and um, increase genetic counselor autonomy. For PCPs, um, I think it's important that they continue to embrace the inevitable increasing responsibility to incorporate genetics um, in their discussions of care, um, particularly being diligent about understanding patient family history, seeking out some of these virtual resources to gain a better understanding of genetics topics um, so that they can continue to be um, that primary provider and take ownership um, to provide comprehensive care. Um, and last but not least, um, our patients and families should really feel empowered to discuss concerns with their providers um, and share their own knowledge um, with them. Uh, you know, they're often such a wealth of information to everybody um, at the table. Um, and so just to remember that everyone is an important piece of this puzzle. We can all learn from each other um, and we're all in it together. Uh, thanks again for your attention and interaction, and I'd be happy to take questions via email or chat. Great, Raylynn, thank you so much. I think we are at 9.59, and, and you and I agreed we'd stay on um, the, the upcoming break, and I'll put emails uh, in again in the chat, um, but really want to um, thank all of the morning um, speakers and uh, turn this over to Erica uh, to get us into the break and have uh, really just great anticipation of hearing from our colleagues in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands as our, our next session after the break. So again, thanks to everybody for participating. Stay on in the chat if you um, want. Uh, and again, Raylynn and I are available for questions.